Blog Talk Radio. Peace, everyone. Bob Glenda here with the Infiogenic Explorer. Hope everyone's having a prosperous and well-lived day. I'd like to welcome everyone to the show, and it's going to be about the ancestors and accessing the ancestors through hallucinogenic mushrooms. So we're here. We're ready to go, and I'm just pleased that uh, you all took the time out of your day to be on the show and uh, listen to some of the things that uh, we have to share this this afternoon. Um, so thank you very much. Well, um, I guess we can start. Uh, not quite at the beginning, but the beginning of uh, the necessary implementation of historical and prehistorical information. Uh, we start out the continent of Africa hundreds of thousands of years ago in the infancy of man and woman on the planet at least in uh, in this time slot, meaning that, you know, we've had several areas of where the world civilization culture has uh, raised its head up and been destroyed through climactic happenings on the earth. So uh, we're here again. And when we look at how we got to this point, uh, we have to look at the involvement of hallucinogens in reconstituting the human mind inside of this whole construct that we exist in, the reconstituting of the mind, utilizing hallucinogens to create novel ways of thinking outside of the box of our regular reality. So when we when we look at the African continent and we look at the time slot moving from great forest into the areas of grasslands where we encountered the mushrooms growing on the dung of the cattle and the ebics and bison and hippopotami and all the other animals that are basically vegetarians who uh, eat grasses and leaves and things like that, and the dung is uh, basically composted, uh, digested grass and uh, leaves and plant matter. So there's that relationship between fungi and plants, Uh, that being only part of the story, growing upon the dung where we encountered it in our search for food, where we, um, moving along with the cattle, um, trying to uh, broaden our dietary uh, regimen by including uh, including uh, meats of uh, larger larger animals because we started out with you know grubs and worms and insects and things like that and. You know, insects aren't really that bad. I basically, uh, when I was in Mexico uh, a bit back, you know, I tried some some insects, uh, kind of like salty peanuts, you know, uh, and it was a new experience, at least uh, as far as consciously ingesting a uh, an insect. You know, there have been a few that have. Uh, when I was talking, running my mouth, the flowing down my mouth and throat, things like that. And then, of course, we have so many parts of me, parts per million insects that are in all of our grains and foodstuffs and things like that that we eat, but they ground up and they look like the rest of the wheat and rice flour and all those different types of things because 
insects live in our uh, grain and food. So we're all ingesting uh, insects, if you uh, eat a piece of bread or a piece of cornbread or something like that. We're getting uh, insect protein and also insect DNA. Um, so as we moved out into larger animals, uh, beginning by stealing uh, part of the kill of uh, predators who basically killed the animals and ingested what they wanted and several orders of uh, animal down the line, uh, we, uh, if lucky, got a chance to steal some of the some of the kill. But our main focus was being able to get enough nutrition to be able to live long enough to have children and those children live long enough to have children so that the genes pass forward and so that we are uh, here where we are today doing basically the same thing. In our search for food, we encountered the uh, psilocybin mushroom, the blue mushroom, a mushroom that when bruised, blues, bruises, it turns blue. And uh, that's showing the psilocybin content in the mushroom. Psilocybin is um, the compound that's contained in the mushroom that becomes uh, psilocin when you eat it. And then the uh, exotic digestible DMT is delivered into the bloodstream and you're able to utilize it and have a psychedelic hallucinogenic or entheogenic gives you different type of thought, different type of relationship to uh, not only the things that we see and hear and, and, and feel, but also it, it gives a outside the box of head knowledge. In other words, what the, the things that you experience under the mushrooms are, they're part of, uh, of what you think and what you feel and what you have experienced and things like that. But then there's a greater observance of these mushrooms inside of the consciousness where it takes you beyond the normal consciousness the normal awakeness that we have, um, it takes you into other dimensions, uh, it takes you into uh, radical thought processes that you would have never had if you just experienced what was in your head and a human mind and consciousness, but a extraordinary consciousness. Some folks would call it God consciousness, higher self consciousness, Christ consciousness, whatever you want to call it. It, it doesn't matter. But a view from the bridge, in other words, being able to rise above the mundane things that we experience in our daily, everyday lives and move off into a place where uh, magic still exists, where the things that we talk about in legend still exist, where exotic creatures, uh, malevolent and uh, beneficial entities are encountered, where strange worlds, strange planets, different galaxies, all these different types of things that are uh, talked about, again, in those long, long, long time ago that we read about and uh, we listen to the stories of legend of the beings who uh, societies pattern themselves after, you know, be it uh, Hercules or Nimrod or Shango or uh, Zeus or it be any number of different types of uh, entities, creatures, uh, that are the prevailing in the multiverse, be it Shango or Obatala or Yemoya or any of these deities, so-called deities that exist in a, another dimension.
dimension that sometimes filter over and cross into our dimensions. But how do we access these creatures? How do we access the uh, the ancestors who are those have moved on from this life into the next life? How do we do that? Some folks believe that it is through ritual that we uh, connect to our ancestors, be it libations or uh, ancestral food or remembrances or calling their name. Um, these are the ways that we contact our ancestors and are inspired to be able to gain wisdom, knowledge, and understanding from them. But there is a another way that is a clearer, more pristine way of accessing the ancestors and that's you know, hallucinogens, the classical tryptamine hallucinogens that we eat now in this taking time have access to. In consideration of older times, a very easy way to access these things, to be able to get these things that no one uh, up until recently uh, could get unless you were the, the CIA or princes or part of a particular um, spiritual guild or something like that. But the average everyday man and woman would not have access to these ways of being, these ways of uh, getting in contact with their ancestors in real time. So um, we're here. We're ready to go and to let you know that mushrooms, but not just mushrooms, ayahuasca, uh, evoca, 5-MeO, DMT, uh, and others can get you in the building, can get you in the place of being able to commune with the dead in your own time without having to die, at least in the physical sense. So what is this mushroom? How is it? How do you how do you take it? Well, basically, you eat it, but they have many different ways of people ingesting it through eating it for, uh, you know, different techniques. Some people like to taste. Others don't like to taste. Some uh, people like me who don't like to taste, you know, uh, I just basically suffer through it. Others who like to taste, of course, they're going to be more... Uh, be in a place that's more gingerly as far as, as eating them and that other people have different ways of doing that, be it with uh, in hot chocolate or is in the form of a tea. Some people, you know, uh, put them on pizza, you know, different ways to get your uh, mushrooms inside of your body. But, you know, I think that uh, the best way is just to bite the bullet, grin and bear it, and just chew them up. And that way, um, you get a straight, you know, chase. So, the mushrooms give you access to places. You know, it may be a, a planet with where the grass is orange and the sky is purple and you have many different suns that are in the right position to be able to give you the best days every day. Um, these are some of the wonderful places that you can go and visit and uh, see exotic creatures like the two-headed, three-headed person or the person with eight arms or any of the creatures in legend and those that were never recorded a legend because many times, um, you know, I always say, you know, to go where no one has gone before. So you can go to places where people are, and then you can go to places where there's never been anyone, never been anything, and you bring your consciousness and create it. 
out of your consciousness. Then there are places that you can go that you didn't create out of your consciousness, but no one has ever, but no one has ever been. These are some of the paradoxes uh, that go along with hallucinogenic use, because uh, amongst the, uh, the people that know, who understand, who traverse these powerful, powerful places and enter into these powerful, powerful areas of knowledge and seek the halls of records and into the uh, libraries of knowledge and wisdom and power and understanding to be able to go and to see and to be able to realize and to be able to uh, put the records on and put the DVDs in and read the books and things like that inside of a library that is larger than this galaxy. Well, information is instant. Information can be downloaded um, and uploaded into because all who've taken the mushrooms, you take out of the mushroom, but you also add to the mushroom. You also add to the wisdom and knowledge of of uh, these particular places and libraries and things like that. So um, it's uh, very, very important that we get in. I was talking, uh, I believe, yesterday on the morphogenetic field, uh, the resonance field that's set up when you get a saturation point of energy of one species doing a particular thing, it then sets up resonance in the morphogenetic field, and that field goes out, and all of the entities inside of that particular group are raised up because of the amount of people doing a particular thing and knowing a certain thing. It's just like children, you know, when you, you know, we have some mushroom children around and things that we know that uh, haven't been taught to them that they already know, you know, they come already knowing. So knowledge is beyond just what is in our mind and our brain. Knowledge is beyond our mind and our brain, and we can tap into and be able to utilize that knowledge and information. And we're moving towards a point once we have enough people, once we have enough people going in. So we need people of courage. We need people of vision. We need people who are smart enough to be able to do a little bit of research and to understand that mushrooms, that these hallucinogenic psychedelic mushrooms are not only non-addicting, but can give you stuff with it. Now, that doesn't mean that you care responsible. We're talking about responsible use. That means that you want to be in a safe environment. You don't want to be sitting on the cliff taking mushrooms and, you know, uh, your navigational skills may not be up to par if you take a high dose and you slip and fall off the cliff. And that's not just a mushroom. That's just you being stupid and, uh, you know, you shouldn't be stupid because you don't want to sit on the edge of a cliff eating mushrooms. You want to be at home in your bed, on the floor, um, maybe on your couch or whatever, so that if you did fall, it would go to be the bed to the floor. And if you're on the floor, you you know, you, you can't fall, fall off of that anyway. So the thing is, is that if you get a chance to be in a safe environment and then you want to, for the first three times that you ingest mushrooms, you know, it doesn't have to be three times. It could be every time you have a sitter with you. But a sitter, not on top of you, not a guide, not a sh- uh, shaman, not any of that, because uh, they don't know no more where you are than they do know that the man in the moon is uh, sitting on the dark side of the moon. They don't know. So you want somebody there in case you become overwhelmed or just 
disorientated or something like that, but you have somebody that you can call on that will give that will give you confidence and say it's going to be all right. So that person can be in the next room, uh, but they don't have to be on top of you, and they're not a guide, and they're not a person who's taking you through anything. The mushroom in itself is the initiate, initiatory process. The mushroom itself is the ritual. The mushroom itself is the guide. The mushroom itself is the, the um, entity that will walk you through this. So you don't need any of those things. You only need your goodwill, good heart, your courage, your tenacity, your ability to be able to hold on to who you are and what you are. You know, we have a big uh, thing dealing with ego. You know, people talk about ego all the time. That's just urban myths tooted into the fabric of psychedelia, you know, because basically it was given to us in books and in the way it was done in the 60s uh, through psychiatrists and psychologists. So they're Freudian, talking Freud, the ego, the id, the superego, and all that kind of stuff, and it filtered into the genre of uh, psychedelia. So everybody's always talking about your ego. Well, you must release your ego and all that kind of, well, I'm not into releasing no ego. The ego is a necessary part of the what and who you are. And if you are dealing with who you are, what you are, where you come from, where you're going, these type of questions, then how are you going to get rid of who you are to find out who you are and where you're from. No, those are the fundamental basic questions inside of consciousness. What am I? Who am I? So you must hold on to the understanding of the self. You hold on to that. I am. That I am. Because I am. And that I am is what you want to hold on to. You don't want to get rid of it. If you get rid of it, then you just throw them everything, float around, and all that kind of stuff, which is, you know, kind of uh, old-fashioned. We are all we are all one. Yep. On a certain level, yes, we're, we're all composed of, of atoms, and those atoms were at one time in stars, and I know that the astronomers and folks like to say, oh, we're stardust, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, okay, all of that. But... That's not what we are, who we are. We're not this physical or anything connected to this physical. So stardust, that's just yesterday. 14 billion years of which they say that this universe, uh, is, is this universe's age is just yesterday. Well, it's not really for 14 billion years. That's what scientists try to postulate now because you can't, you know, if you're, Gauging time, which is a uh, which is a manifestation of the Earth going around the Sun in 365 days and all that kind of stuff, you know, corrected for the leap year and all that. But you know, if you didn't have a Sun and the Earth is only four billion years old, and you relate rate time uh, if the Earth going around the Sun and you didn't have an Earth before that, then how do you count all them other 10 billion years without, you know, without the Earth rotating around the sun? Well, you know, they're going to do some fancy mathematics and things like that, and uh, all of that doesn't mean anything. The Vedas of those who sat and counted the days said that it was uh, 150 trillion years that this universe is been in existence. Just this universe, not the other universes that it unfolded out of and universes that are older than that because there's a multiverse. There's billions and billions and billions of different universes, some that interpenetrate one another, others that are so far away from one another, 
that it doesn't even make sense to try to relate the distances between trillions of years of trillions of trillions and trillions of light years that separate one universe from the other. So when we talk about ancestors, they are as close as the sweat on your skin, but as far away as those far away universes that are trillions and trillions and trillions of times farther than we could ever imagine. So how do we, in a superluminal sense, in other words, faster than light sense, how do we communicate with someone that is so far away? We understand the closeness. We understand that they exist inside of our DNA, which is their DNA, which is their parents' DNA, which is their parents' DNA, and all the way back through the physical of which we exist in. So by taking the mushrooms in a safe environment with the right mindset, in other words, classic psychedelics talk about setting setting. You don't want to take a bunch of mushrooms the night after your mother dies. You don't want to take a bunch of mushrooms when you just fought with your spouse or whatever and you're upset and these types of things. So your mindset, you want to be clear, you want to be focused, you want to be sitting in your power when you take these powerful compounds, or they will shake the screws loose in your, um, they'll shake the screws loose. No doubt about it. So we need to uh, understand I don't know what happened. There's always there's always something that uh that tries to slow us down, but I'm back. Uh hope everybody's still there and listening. So how do we access through our consciousness the ancestral realms? It is by will visualization through the magic that these compounds contain when the DMT is in the bloodstream and it supercharges the receptor sites, the brain material in the gut and in the heart and in the brain synergize, link up, for charge, put us in the position to be able to breach realities, be able to move past our three-dimensional five-sense reality that we exist in most of the time and move off into the hyper-dimensional, trans-dimensional, ultra-dimensional areas of the different dimensions inside of the brain it can be connected to. And those pathways reach into the galaxy, reach into the infraparticle realms of knowledge, the knowledge of the very, very small that we've talked about before, and reach out into the multiverse, into the areas that are part of those realms that the ancestors have moved to as they moved out of the human physical and moved into the expansive exotic areas of existence inside of a different dimension, higher dimensions, 
how do we access these higher dimensions? When you eat the mushrooms at high dose, it delivers the higher dimensions. It is then your discipline, your will, and your intention to go and to see a particular person. It may be your grandmother that passed. It may be your grandfather that passed. It may be an old teacher. It may be a teacher that you've never met that was in the physical at one time that you want to have access to. If you're a martial artist, say an Aikido person, and you wanted to access Wei Shiba, who was the inventor of of Aikido, then you would hold that intention and utilize your will, your magic, and your power to commune with this spirit who has passed on and is in that other dimension. This is how, as martial artists, you know, who train entheogenically, it could be um, to make a comparison. There are particular katas in traditional martial arts. The katas are the what you would call the um, imaginative, because you're imagining that you are fighting against an opponent, and that opponent is giving you a particular scenario of kicks and punches or whatever, and you're blocking those punches, and then you are destroying this person. So it is up to your imagination to actually see this person in front of you, see the punch coming. You punch, you block it, and then you strike the person, and the person is down, and you actually see that person go down. And then someone else comes, and you turn, and a person kicks, and you block the kick, and you punch. So this is a scenario of a particular fighting form, kata, or whatever that you're, you're doing. But under the influence of the entheogen or the psychedelic or the hallucinogen, under that influence, it makes the experience fuller because you you enter a realm of a separate reality, whereas you're actually there. You're not just in the school and you're doing it performing a particular form. So if you take, say, a African style or an Indonesian style where you're performing the animal mimicry, where you actually become the crocodile or you actually become the baboon or you actually become the falcon or you actually become the bull, you're taking on, again, a separate reality where you shapeshift, you move into the actual form of the leopard or the bull. You actually move into that form. And by moving into that form, you feel and you smell the way that the bull smells and the way the bull sees. You see the way the falcon sees, far sight, piercing sight, being able to stare into the sun without blinking. You have that type of sight. So these are the things that we're talking about as far as full access that are in legend that are talked about, whether it be the the legend of the the werewolf or the legend of the uh, other creatures that people turn into in night, you know, because that was all part of uh, entheogenic usage. People would see these things and commune with these things. So the ancestral power, the ancestral energy that is prevalent inside of each one of us is encoded each Ancestor has a uh, a code, an access code inside of the computers, inside of the central servers. And you put in the IP address of that ancestor inside of the DNA, inside of the uh, memory, inside of the exotic areas of library or particular places where you go and glean information that this thing or this person is accessible through their particular encoded information, 
the codes are then put into consciousness, and the consciousness creates that scenario for who's ever ingesting the mushrooms and is adding and accessing that particular vehicle of knowledge because it's all about information. Information is paramount. Information is what the universe is built on. I know some people say it's built on love and it's built on spiritual power, but that doesn't mean anything. Information is what everything is built on. So the ancestors, if you're in a particular ritualistic spiritual structure and you have been trying to connect to a particular force or power inside of the multiverse, if you're trying to connect with a certain force in the infraparticle realms, in the triple deep darkness, access is given through our traditional plants and fungi that were created for these purposes. created as a mnemonic devices, devices of memory, so that you will remember who you truly are and what you truly are beyond the illusion, beyond the maya, beyond the, the false mask is truly awesome, it's truly powerful, and is truly the entity that is and would be called a super being. But we have descended and we take on the sensibilities of the human factor to gain experience, to gain experiences that we can share into the super self, the super soul. So all those things that have come before and all the things that come after are accessible under these realms of consciousness, under these understandings of consciousness that are not that difficult to be able to get into. We think, you know, that you're supposed to punish yourself for 40 or 50 years to access these things. And many people think that psychedelics are not legitimate because you're not suffering or you're not doing this and doing that. But the thing is that uh, psychedelics is no picnic for real. If you're doing a party dose, then some people say that's fun. When they go to the uh, side trance or they go to the party and they take a little bit of mushrooms, maybe a little bit of uh, whatever they're taking, maybe they take some, some acid or some other things. And at the party, the music is bumping and the, lights are flashing and you're there with a bunch of people and it has a group mind and uh, pull you into the rhythm and all of those things uh, happen in a part parcel of this thing on one level. But then when you're talking about alone in the dark in your space where there's no music and no lights, it's just you and it, you and the mushroom, you and the mushroom spirit. That's when the rubber meets the road. That's when the pedal hits the metal. When and where you are alone and you have nothing naked than the day you were born. ready to take on whatever comes, whatever's presented, whatever's there. No matter what it is, you're willing, willing, ready, and able to face it. So when the dimensions start to shift and the wormhole starts to open up and there's a beckoning of the spirit or there's a visitation of the entity, 
You stand firm in your power, knowing that nothing out here that can nothing out here can hurt you. Nothing out here that can kill you. Do a bunch of rigmarole, but ultimately you are an immortal. Nothing can kill you. The the only thing that the only thing Hubert can't be done is for you to die. Uh, recently, uh, and I talked about it, I believe, last show, but that show got corrupted as far as going up and things like that. Um, I took the, the toad medicine, the 5-MEO, a few times. Uh, once on the mountain, once after, and once uh, in uh, in Hungary. So um, I haven't really had a chance to explore the 5-MEO, toad medicine, toad venom, smoking it. I haven't had a chance to explore it really the way I'd, I'd like to. It is an interesting compound. It is a different kind of hallucinogen, uh, especially in looking at it and looking at psilocybin, really different. Psilocybin is highly visual. You have the, the exotic creatures, of course. You'll have faraway lands. You'll have technologies. You'll have artificial intelligences. You'll have all these different types of things and colors and all of that. With the 5MO, 5MEO, it's, it's none of that. It's the best I can say is like the first 15, 20 minutes of being dead when you. When you come out of that body and you're just standing there and you're saying, what's going on? This is really kind of weird here, but I'm, uh, my, I'm talking to myself. My brain is working. I'm, I'm not dead. I'm here. That that ego thing that folks in psychedelics say they want to get rid of, I'm still, it's still there. I'm still me. I'm still I. This is something uh, that is, is uh, that each and every one of us who's an explorer, an entheogenic explorer, should try. Mushrooms, I'll tell you, are my thing. That's the top of the heap. That is the quintessential hallucinogen. It will deliver the experience of all of the other hallucinogens at specific doses, all of the different experiences. So I'm not taking anything away from the mushroom. Spaces that I was in under the 5-MEO, I've been in under the influence of the mushrooms before, but it was just a standalone thing with the 5-MEO that didn't have the other components that would be in the psilocybin with it. So the 5-MEO, I would behoove you if you get a chance to get close to it or get a chance to do it to try it, it's it's uh, it's weird, not visual, but it will um, uh, leave you with a lot of things to think about as far as consciousness and uh, the oneness and the aloneness and the apart from all of the other things that we think hold us together because it, it can be uh, a a consciousness shifting encounter by MEO and looking at its looking at its opposite with the DMT, the pure DM the pure smoked DMT. Some folks of course inject it I'm not in the needles, so I just have to smoke it. And do it that way. And I'm not a smoker. Uh, I'm not a smoker in any sense of the word. I'm getting my heating settings right on my vaporizer um, because the vaporizer just gives you the vapor from the heat, from the heat, and it's more efficient. And especially you cannabis, uh, cannabis users. Um, I know in the uh, black community that we have a uh, a cannabis 
you know, whether you roll it with papers or blunts or whatever, uh, it's a social event to roll stuff up and folks to see how you can manipulate your uh, your leaves and things inside that little piece of paper. But vaporizing is the way to go. Carcinogens of of uh, burning up plant material, you won't waste the majority of what you got because vaporizing will pull all the constituents out, put it in a vapor, and you can um, get it that way, and it'll be much more efficient. You'll get more bang for your buck, but it takes that social rolling thing out of it because a lot of people are more into the social role and thing than they are into the experience and things like that. But this is the cannabis show. Uh, we may have one later on in the year and bring some cannabis aficionados on to speak about uh, cannabis and the benefits of cannabis and also um, the different oils and waxes and things like that, um, which I'm uh, in the midst of working with for uh, old martial arts injuries that are inflamed that I'm working on myself. But back to the uh, tryptamine hallucinogens. So uh, along with the DMT and the 5-MEL DMT, of course, there's uh, the problem child of Albert Hoffman, which is LSD, which is regardless of the hype and regardless of the propaganda, a wonderful compound. I know that people think that, oh, well, LSD in the 1960s is going to throw your clothes off, you're going to get long hair, you're going to be a hippie or whatever. That's not the case. It is a still lightly tapped, unexplored plenum of information with the LSD. Uh, we don't know where we can go with it as of yet because it's been marginalized by the propaganda of the 1960s and put into a box, you know, um, artificial. It's not, you know, artificial. All this stuff is artificial. Everything you think is real and organic and natural and all that kind of stuff is all artificial. It's all constructed. It's all put together in uh, a computer. You know, of course, not the same kind of computer that we have or not the same kind of computer, computer that we claim are quantum computers here. I'm talking about the the real computers that generate all of reality, that generate all the things that we see, do, hear, smell, think about, comprehend. It's all artificial. So don't give me the artificial, LSD artificial. LSD uh, utilize the sentient being Albert Hoffman to synthesize it from the virtual realms, and that's where it comes from. So it's a it's a powerful, wonderful tool for those people who have the uh, wherewithal and the ability to to utilize it and contact its its uh, uh, its matrix matrix of information. And then there's the Eboka or the Ebogaine, cracking open the head, the twa abattoir informational structure that went into particular societies and is the most looked at in Gabon, but spreading to other places. Um, the only person that I knew that really could grow it was... Uh, our esteemed ancestor, master herbalist, Dr. Kweku Ando uh, from Ghana, who was a traditional herbalist and healer, healer. And his father and grandfather and his family line were traditional healers, traditional herbalists. So these traditional herbalists not only have the knowledge of what they have, but they have the knowledge of the ancestral power inside of herbs because you have the genetic encodement to decode the particular herbs and talk to the spirit of the herbs like George Washington Carver did. Dr. Ando could grow the, the Iboka or the Ibogaine because he has 
a family that is recognized by the planters, by the plant queendom. So they recognize who is part of the informational structure. And that goes through all guilds, all true and legitimate secret societies, which is like drumming. I go through it with drummers all the time. And especially with drums like the one that comes from the Senegambia region, Jimbe drum. How do we access the ancestors that took the entheogens and they called to the spirit of the drums because they had drum houses, the houses where the drums lived. And they had shrines, in other words, the deconstructing code mechanisms inside of the drums, inside of the drums. They came from the planet of the drums where the drums came from because they went entheogenically through the wormhole to the planet of drums and asked the drum elders, could they bring Jimbe back to the earth? They brought the Jimbe drum back to the earth as a war drum. It's not a celebration drum. It is a war drum. And only drummers who are the lines of those who went in to the planet of the drums and brought that drum back, only those in those lines are and have the permission to play those drums. Nobody else. That's not Japanese, African drummers and dancers. That is not the uh, women's drum troupe because women are not supposed to play that drum. Y'all can get mad at me if you want. And especially not between your legs standing up because it will destroy your womb. It will create crazy babies. It will mess your female innards up standing up playing that drum. Now, does that mean that women don't have their own drums? No, because women have their own drums of which those women entheogenically took their power plants and fungi and went to the planet of drums and brought back specific drums for women that are drums of power for female power. And when they play those drums, that's when magic and things happen. It doesn't happen when women play the drums that they're not supposed to play. And men are not supposed to play the women's drums just because we're in modern times and feel like it. They used to use them drums to execute people. Fire and thunder and lightning came out of the out of the back of those drums. And they could ha- hit the tone. They'd tie a person to a tree and smack the tone, and it would disrupt the central nervous system of the person and kill them immediately without pain. That was one of the reasons for bringing that drum back. And in the old days, My teachers told me that in the old days, when they had the drums and the drums were in the drum house, you could go by and you'd hear the drums talking to one another. But they'd be playing the tones without anybody playing because the drums have a family. Drums are in families. So these families of drums of which the djembe is part of and a line of those drummers who are traditional drummers. Everybody can't play the drum. Just like you like the drum, you went by a doggone um, drum and dance troupe and you saw the lead drummer and he was he was tearing it up and you liked it. So now you're going to go to the, you know, to the, the African gift shop and buy you a djembe and you start playing the djembe. No. But a lot of it doesn't matter anyway because those drums don't have any power in them. They're not the real drums. They, when they uh, when the drums first got here and folks was pissing blood because you got that drum up under your testicles. And those tones are, uh, if you're not playing the right tones, then you're going to degrade your doggone testicles. And women, of course, um, 
what it does to your womb, we don't we won't even start talking about. But these are part of the mysteries of entheogenic sojourn that they brought back knowledge and information, transdimensional knowledge from other places, from the ancestors, from the ancestral drums. Because they have their own planet, they have their own society, they have their own elders. Ancestral contact is no different than, again, because of a martial artist. You go to the planet of war, just as Arjuna went looking for transdimensional weapons before the battle between the Kuravas and the, uh, because of the Pandavas and the Kuravas, that they went out to find, went out to find divine weapons, weapons given by the gods, the weapons that they used, because the, the, because the gods used weapons. Don't think, you know, and I'm saying gods, I'm not talking in the Judeo-Christian sense of one big person who rules everything. That ain't it. It's more of the Pantheon thing where they fight for supremacy and stuff like that, and they get jacked up also. So when talking about the one that I want to talk about or transfer information about is the chakra. Because people have taken the New Age works of C.W. Leadbeater and Arthur Avalon, the serpent power, and the chakras, and the information of Helena Petrova Levatsky and the the late 19th century, 20th century theosophists and Rosicrucianists and others who have place the chakras in uh, positions of prominence, whereas the true chakra is the weapon of Krishna. It is a discus, two counter-rotating discs separated by the space of a Fermi, which is 10 to the negative 15. So it looks like one complete disc, but they counter-rotate one goes clockwise and the other goes counterclockwise. And there are several million serrations on each side on the edge of each disc. And those discs are positioned on the finger so that when you raise the finger, the chakra appears. And as you think of your enemy, before and faster than thought, the chakra disappears, does not cover the space between your enemy and the chakra that is on your finger. It doesn't cover that space in space and time. What it does is faster than light goes through the neck of the opponent and appears back on the finger of Krishna. If you remember my original martial arts tape, I show the movement of the positioning of the chakra in the first movement. It is part and was shown vividly in the dances of Kwame Ishangi and the Ishangi dances in that bara, which is the dance of strength. That movement is shown the positioning of the chakra where the finger is raised and the chakra appears. So that's what that's that's part of martial arts, accessing the ancestral power, accessing the ancestral weapons, transdimensional weapons. In the battle in the battles that are coming, we have will not be Utilized. That's why the Baghdad Museum was sacked. That's why world wars are um, started in exotic, stupid places. That you know, you know, why are we worried about that? You know, they ain't got no gold and diamonds. They don't have no oil. 
or they say that they got oil and diamonds and things like that. But they got more oil and diamonds. Well, diamonds ain't worth none of these rocks, but they got more oil. They got more oil. They you probably never run out of oil. Piled up. They raise and lower the price according to what they feel like. It's all artificial to make you think that there's a shortage or that there's a worth. That's not that's not the case. The wars are started to round up the relics, the power objects that will help in the defense of this galaxy are here from the olden times, pre-12,600 BCE, when the asteroidal impact hit the North American continental shelf and melted all that ice and flooded over all the different um, coastal cities around the world, which is the time when Atlantis sunk. Now, of course, they didn't call it Atlantis. And, of course, it wasn't the, you know, the whole thing that they, you may see in a movie. But that's when those places sunk. Teams of divers going off the coast of all these different ancient sites looking for power objects and relics. Poseidon's trident. Objects like that. The conch shells of Krishna, the conch shells of Arjuna, the sword of Achilles that he used in Troy. The sword of Troy, these ancient relics that are power objects that can be used transdimensionally throughout the multiverse. Not a weapon that has to do with... um, just being human and killing human beings can be used in the defense of this galaxy against anything. Thor's hammer is not a myth. But if you're not taking infusions, if you're not going in, you wouldn't know that. You think it's just a tale of power, just a mythology, just a historical fluke. And it is not. It is real as the side of your house. Ancestors, how do we access that ancient magic, that ancient sorcery? How do we learn to manipulate reality and manipulate matter? Through going in and sitting down in the classroom with the master teachers of these things. Thousands and hundreds of thousands of years to be able to move one atom other than the ones that you move around to create yourself and to create all of the stuff that we exist in. But the codes got us locked up inside of this whereas we get the unlock codes. Unlock that so-called junk DNA. All of the 90% of the non-coding, non-protein creating DNA that has all all your superpower stuff on it. It is about becoming more. It is breaching the human. That's what the entheogen is about. That's what the contact with the ancestors is about. No longer being a human being and being bound by the physics of the three-dimensional, four-dimensional realm that we exist in most of the time. Because most of the time, you can you know, sometimes you get out of it. You get out of it in dreams. You get out of it when you travel entheogenically. Sometimes you may get hit by a bus and get out of it. So we have the ability in real time, right now, right now, to be able to deal with the type of things that I'm talking about. 
we have several things coming up that if you miss it, you're going to hate yourself for missing it. You're going to hate yourself for missing it. The Women in Entheogens Conference coming up October 13th, 14th, and 15th in Cleveland, Ohio, in honor of the mushroom goddess, Kai Wingo. This was her vision, and we are continuing with it. I'm not a speaker because there are no men speaking. Only the women are speaking on women's mysteries and entheogens, on the utilization of mushrooms and other tryptamine DNA compounds during gestation, pregnancy, during delivery, and afterwards utilizing mushrooms during the time of breastfeeding so that the babies get the psilocybin and psilocin in the milk. So this is this is off the charts as far as dealing with this. There'll be uh, several panels on these types of things, dealing with mushrooms and conception for those who are trying to have babies, where you can go and look at and face-to-face your baby before it is implanted inside of your womb. Let me, let me share some things with you. Folks trying to have a baby. Where the man and the women, woman is having sex or making love, whichever way you want to call it. And that the woman can look at the sperm, the man can look at the sperm to spread it on a mat and to be able to look at the sperm and talk to the sperm. What a sperm will move along that particular mat and create characters, writings, divination. Will our baby come? And the sperm will form the letters in the cursive alphabet of what we use, you know, day to day. It will write out on that mat, yes, the baby will come. The sperm will write that out. This is old stuff. Y'all don't know nothing about that. How do I know this? Because I train with the masters. I study with the masters, and you lay that sperm down on the mat and ask it anything. It's spermal divination because the sperm are in another dimension. They're connected to another dimension. They are the conduit from the dimension, the baby dimension, to this dimension. So you can talk to the baby through the sperm to spread out on the mat. Now, I'm not going to tell you how you get the sperm out to put it on the mat. Use your imagination. Your, your the man and woman is there, but you spread it out, thin layer, and they will raise up and speak. They will write letters. They will even do metal nature. But I don't want to get. I don't want to go too deep with you this time, because. We got a long time to be on this program. I'm gonna be revealing the old stuff. I'm gonna be revealing the stuff that they say. Uh, <laughs> this is the stuff to be <laughs> not to, not to put out on the air. But what can anybody do with it anyway? It's locked up. It's all encoded. It's only those who have number one the genetic proclivities to get in. Well, everybody don't get in because everybody ain't real. They're artificial constructs. This is the time for these secrets to come out. This is the time for these things to be manifest in the population so that the people who are in, in, in harmony with these methods, with this understanding, can utilize them. So, yes, when you want to make a baby, 
and the mushrooms will teach you how to do this. They'll open up the portals for you and your your spouse, a woman, you know, a man trying to have a baby. They will open up the portals for you to go to the baby planet and see the babies. Divine with the sperm. We're not even going to get talk about the menstrual. We're not even going to talk about the menstrual blood because you do the same thing with the menstrual blood. You spread it on the mat. You talk to the menstrual blood. And menstrual blood is, is it has, we were talking on uh, Brother Hunk's Hunk show that um, about the menstrual blood and DMT and that and mixing it with a monoamine oxidase inhibitor and all the old magic and the old sorcery that was part of the ancient starfire, the true first monatomic gold platinum. Dealing with the nano diamonds, the infinity discs and infinity stones, just like in the Marvel comics. The ones Thanos trying to get that people say, well, those are impossible. You can't, you know, this is just Marvel comic books. Well, there's Marvel comic books. I got one in my drawer right here. Clothes of its own volition, not radioactive. Back in the day, I took all the exotic metals before it got corrupted and everybody started utilizing everything and telling you that it's monatomic gold and all that kind of stuff. That stuff wasn't no more monatomic gold and uh, it wasn't monatomic gold. It's a monatomic platinum and palladium, ruthenium, rhodium, uh, all of the exotic metals, the same exotic metals that came down from the highlands in Africa down the Nile and then the under inundation period swelled out and left that silt with the super monotonic elements in it coming from out of the out of the mountains. It had Nile diamonds in it, palladium, platinum, as I said before, rhodium, ruthenium, uh, all these different exotic metals were in it, and that's what they fed the population on. The grasses that the Apis bull ate, of which the high priest mushrooms were taken from the dung of the Apis bull that ate the canary grass that was fed by the exotic minerals coming from the highlands of the most um, powerful soil on earth came 4,000 miles down and deposited that silt. Priest mushrooms were, were taken off the white, pure white bull that ate the canary grass that has the DMT, the 5-MeO DMT, and the mono, uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors inside of the grasses. And that synergy of all of those DMTs and the monoamine oxidase inhibitors given to that white bull, of which the sporulation of the Tamarian blue psilocybin mushroom posited on them cow pies and the mushrooms that grew from that were the ones that were ingested by the high priests who stayed not only in uh, dark womb technologies back in the temples, and the highest initiation of the dark womb was in the Great Pyramid in Egypt, where they took and in the what they call the, the king's sarcophagus in the king's chamber where they took their mushrooms and they took their um, DMT and went into that coffin. And the shout-out to Orion and shout-out to Sirius commune with their brothers of those who had created the craft. 
so it goes through all the gills. If you just want to, if you just want to visit Grandma, you take Grandma's wig, or you take Grandpa's hat, and you take that wig and you put it on your head, and you ingest your mushrooms, and you get into Grandma's head, and it creates a synergy because Grandma's sweating that wig, Grandma had that wig, and of course it don't have to be a wig; it could be Grandma's spoon. This is just to help you and synergize how to connect with the codes. None of these outer trappings are necessary, but it helps in the feeling. Go to grandma's house if you still got it. Trip in grandma's house. Use the time codes. Run it back to 1965 when grandma and grandpa was there. And the uncles and aunts were all little kids, and you've seen them running through the running through the yard and things like that. The virtual reality program is already here. We don't need the virtual reality because we already got it. Of course, you can use it. I'm sure they're going to be some nice games in a little while because I'm going to buy one myself and have a good time with it. But I'm saying the real virtual reality we already have. So, yes, the martial artist, go by the old school where the master then died. Remember that place. Remember what it was like. Remember the smell. Remember the sweat. Remember the blood that was on the floor. That's how you access the ancestors with the entheogens. As I said, no outer trappings are needed, but they can be utilized. You do it the way you want to. You do it the way you feel like it. You got your grandfather's hat, put your grandfather's hat on. You got your grandfather's hat, take the hat and put it in the chair next to, across from where you are while you're sitting, taking the entheogens and start talking to grandpa. Grandpa is going to come and put his hat on. Cleveland, Ohio. You can go to Eventbrite 2017 Women of Entheogens Conference and get your tickets. They're not expensive. We made it available to the community because it's a community event. It's not one of the events in Prague or Amsterdam where you're paying three, four hundred dollars US to get into the event and you know, all the speakers are PhDs and doctor this and doctor that and psychiatrists and psychologists, and anthropologists and all these different types of folks. These are the folks that are actually doing the work, that are actually putting in time, putting in work, the entheogens. Not somebody who's written a book and who's acclaimed all over the world for their psychedelic knowledge and information who's never taken it. You know, I've asked some of these guys personally, well, have you ever taken it? Well, no, I'm being objective and, you know, and my peers with, you know, that type of thing. Well, you ain't took nothing then, huh? Okay, well. What am I to say about that? The cook must take the brew. You don't give nothing to nobody that you haven't tasted yourself. But these are people actually doing the work. These are women actually doing the work. Women who usually won't be on bill as far as Prague and Amsterdam and places like that, but have a tale to tell. So come out. It's well worth it. If you want to find out, find out about the lineup, who's going to be on the program, who's going to be lecturing on the panels, go to www.DetroitPsychedelics. Make sure to put the S on it, psychedelics.com. And you go to the drop down. It'll say women and entheogens. You'll find out who's speaking and uh, things like that. Uh, we'll also be Sunday having a celebration of the life of Kai Wingo at the Buckeye Mushroom Farm. Uh, we want everybody to come out. We want everybody to be part of this so that we can keep this going. We have few psychedelic conferences in urban environments and in environments where the people can get a chance to get in there 
and this is one of them. So we need you all. Come on out. We need your support. Also, the WAMA, which is the World African Martial Arts uh, Conference, is coming about next month also. So those who are interested in the martial arts, just hit me up on Facebook. Um, we'll be having uh, Capoeira. We'll be having Silat. We'll be having several forms of African martial art. We'll be having uh, training sessions, lectures, all those different types of things. Um, also, without further ado, uh, this program costs money. We need your support, your financial support to help keep the uh, program growing and going. We'll be growing next month because next month we're going to start bringing in, uh, bringing in uh, our co-host and we'll be bringing in also um, guests to the program. You'll be able to uh, call in and ask questions and be on the phone and all that kind of stuff. Um, as usual, I wanted to take the first several times just to try to get people acquainted to the entheogens, mushrooms, DMT, and those type of things so that you can get up to speed. You still have to do your own research. You still have to read. You still have to Google all those things to get up to speed so that you know that this is something you want to do because we want people who are actually doing it. We don't want the curious. We want people to get the information, see that the information is sound, and then start going in because we need a saturation point of people that are going in so that we can set up the morphogenetic field to raise up all these people who aren't going to come in. So if everybody listening, I'm not saying no thousand dollars, a hundred dollars, but we'll take a thousand, we'll take a hundred, because you can just donate ten dollars to the program. And I'm, uh, I'm not sending it up on Eventbrite or one of these other things. It's to my PayPal, so I don't have to uh, pay or share the money out. And that's Kalindi at Hotmail.com, K-I-L-I-N-D-I at Hotmail.com. And you go on the PayPal and you donate what you feel is necessary. If you believe in the work, donate and help us to continue because we go to a lot of places off the beaten path, and our conference is cheap. Places where the conferences are cheap, they can be four or five hundred dollars, and another fifteen hundred dollars, two thousand dollars in flight and hotel, and all those different type of things that we got to keep going to be able to get um, up to date information on what's happening in the world of psychedelics, because we can our uh, 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 True information, we're getting it from going in. We get, we getting it from being in the real, in the realm of the ancestors, under the plank length and the triple thick darkness where light does not even exist. But when we go into conferences and things like that, and getting flyers and books and all these different type of things, it takes, it takes resources. So we need your help in. Um, and helping to provide that so we bring back the information to be able to share with you. We have people that we meet that we think, oh, man, we need to get this person on the show. Uh, before it was a show. Now it is this show because many times, you know, people don't, you know, they don't have the vision to see that what this person is talking about is well worth having them on the show. So now we have our own show, and we can bring in those people that you would not ever get a chance to listen to because they're not on the beaten path. They're not on the regular shows, but they'll be on this show. So donate um, what you feel is necessary. We know that, you know, you can't go to the movie. If you take your family, you're going to spend on there eighty, a hundred dollars going to the movie. You know, a sandwich is $6. So we're asking you to donate, and that's not a big part of what we're doing because we're going to do what we do because we cause it's for us to do. But we want you all to help us so that we're all sharing and keeping this thing going. That's Kalindi, K-I-L-I-N-D-I, at hotmail.com. Go to PayPal, donate, and you can do that as soon as the show is off. So we're coming close to the end of this show. 
the ancestors are within us, they're around us, they're in the ancestral uh, realms. We have access to those realms. We have a way to go there. We have a way to help them manifest themselves here. We can uh, share with them love. We can share with them uh, understanding. We can share with them all the things that we are, and they can share with us all the things that they are, their love and their understanding, and they can let us know that where they are, it's not some place to be feared. It is a place to be embraced when that time comes. So stand tall. Be ready to embrace the ancestors, and we can do it through these little mushrooms. Thank you very much. Signing off. Um, hit me on Facebook, uh, Facebook Messenger. If you're on a friend, I'm kicking people off who aren't <laughs> to do anything. So if you're not on now, you'll be on soon. Thank you very much, and have a good night. Hope you've enjoyed the program. Next month, we're going to be bringing in the guests. We're going to pump it up. Thank you very much, and have a good evening. Peace.